Um, what I'm going to do is turn to the practical app or one practical application of some of the longevity analysis that we have seen this morning and yesterday and um, talk about the, the mortality and longevity experience and how the analysis is used uh, for members of what is the UK's largest funded defined benefit pension plan. Um, and I'm really going to focus on predominantly on the pensioner and retiree portion of that population and, and go into a bit of detail about, uh, about the kinds of uh, risks that we're looking at. I, I started at USS in January this year in a um, uh, chief risk officer role with, with the remit to build up a, um, an enterprise-wide risk function. And longevity is, is certainly one of the risks uh, that I've been looking at over the past few months. Now let me give the game away. Um, it's true that academics do live longer. And they live longer than the general population in the UK by quite a margin. And some of the things we've heard today may be explanations for this. Well, academics clearly are more highly educated than the average member of the general population. They tend to belong to a higher socioeconomic class on average, and they tend to be more affluent than the average member of the general population. All those three factors, which are uh, by themselves determinants, although not uncorrelated, they are correlated determinants of, of longevity. Um, all those factors are playing into the, um, uh, the observed uh, higher life expectancy of the academic community um, for both males and females. And what's more, I'll, I'll show that this is, um, while there are some variations uh, within the population, it is uh, reasonably homogeneous in terms of, and, and there's relatively little variation in terms of, uh, of the outcomes for, for life expectancy. So I'm going to address three things. Firstly, give you a little bit of background on Professor David Blake's pension plan. Um, I will see just how well off he's going to be in retirement. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, historical actuarial valuations and what kind of mortality assumptions have been used in the past um, and, and how we've, we've, we've seemed to evolve to a state where we, we have a, a reasonably uh, accurate, reasonably, a reasonable amount of confidence in, in the actuarial assumptions that are now being used for, for this particular plan. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, recent USS experience uh, using up-to-date data for the, uh, the most recent financial year, which uh, finished on the 31st of March 2015. So let me begin. Um, just to recap... Uh, some of the facts that David gave you. It's, uh, it's a pension plan with about 57 billion pounds sterling of liabilities on a technical provisions basis. On a buyout basis or an economic basis, that is actually north of 70 billion. But on a technical provisions basis, 57 billion. Uh, with assets as of the 31st of March of 49 billion. Of course, we all know about the market volatility that hit uh, financial markets in, in August, so it's a bit lower than that at the moment. In fact, at uh, 5 p.m. last night, that stood at uh, something like 47.1 billion, uh, down a couple, of, down 4% on, <coughs> on that level. Now, USS is a plan designed for the higher education sector, and it is a multi-employer plan. There are, as you see, 364 different sponsoring employers and they share a mutual liability. They share mutually the returns on the assets, and it's a last man standing joint liability. So in other words, if every other institution fails and goes insolvent, the one institution that's left, that is uh, Cass Business School, uh, will have to pick up the tab for the deficit. Um, so that's the nature of the plan. Uh, we have 334,000 members across the UK, the vast majority of which are academic uh, staff. But that includes everything from professors and vice chancellors through to postdocs. And more recently, there have been senior administrative members of the university admitted 
to the plan. But broadly speaking, it's mostly a pension plan for academics. What's more, in contrast to most UK and US pension plans, it is open, active and growing. Um, the chart on the left gives you the evolution of uh, the membership over the last five years, uh, broken down by, by different membership category. Uh, the chart on the top right shows the composition by members. You can see it's 44% active members, um, some 34% deferred members who have vested benefits but have left the university system, and, uh, and then the rest, the 22%, are, are pensioners. Now, counting number of lives or number of members is great when you're looking at demographics, but when you're looking at a pension plan, it's not quite so useful. What's much more useful is looking at the liability weighted or the benefit weighted count of the membership. And the, the bottom chart on the right shows you a slightly different picture of the composition of the plan. Um, when weighted by liabilities, you're now 50% active. Um, the deferreds have shrunk by about, uh, a third, by about two thirds from 34% down to 10%. And then the pensioner group has, has doubled in size to, um, to about 39%. So that's what the plan looks like. I'm going to focus more or less exclusively on the pensioner side of this, so that 39% uh, on the left-hand side of that, that bottom right chart. <coughs> in terms of age profile, it's fairly well distributed. Um, the deferreds and actives have an average age of about 45 years. And the pensioners have an average age of about 71 years. What's more, the membership is fairly evenly spread across the UK. And it doesn't matter whether you look at lives or amounts, you get more or less the same picture visually. Um, we've got good national coverage. And you might, th might therefore expect this to be fairly representative of the kinds of trends going on uh, across the, the nation on at least a geographical basis. Now, I've said before, it's a relatively homogeneous group. It is the same industry. It is largely the same occupation. And what's more, differences in socioeconomic class are relatively small. From the, um, from the chart you see here on the right, uh, you have 84% of male members and 81% of female members falling in the highest socioeconomic group. For the UK population as a whole, that number is 43%. And for the UK population of retirees or pensioners, that number is 63%. So you see there is a, a rather larger concentration um, to this higher socioeconomic class and a much lower one to the... Um, to the low and medium socioeconomic classes. And we'll, we'll drill into that a little bit more in a moment. But what matters for a pension plan is the value of the liabilities that you have to meet through investments and contributions. And therefore, it's important to understand the sensitivity of your liabilities to mortality. And as Andre was just saying, one of the key sensitivities, or the most important sensitivity actually, is the trend of mortality improvements. And the sensitivity of a liability to the trend of mortality improvements is something that, that we call Q duration, such that Q duration is the percentage increase in the value of the liability if mortality improvements were to be higher than you expect by 1% per year on a compounded basis. So working it out for, for David's pension plan, what we see is overall it's got a Q duration of 7.4. So if we get our mortality improvements wrong by 1% per year, the liability will be 7.4% greater. And you can see intuitively pensioners have a slightly lower Q duration, less sensitivity, and actives and deferreds uh, are much higher. Q duration or sensitivity. So 
all the longevity analysis that we do is ultimately leading to an understanding of how the liability will move as the demographics changes and as mortality changes going into the future. So let me now move on to talk about the mortality tables um, that are being used within the plan and have been used within the plan. So in the UK, by law, you have to do a formal statutory actuarial valuation once every three years. And at that time, part of this process involves the analysis of the mortality experience and an, an assessment of what life expectancy is going to be forward, going forward, uh, all sort of rolled up in the choice of a mortality table. And remember, the choice of a mortality table involves a choice of level and a choice of improvements going forward. And if we look at um, the last four valuations going back nine years for, for USS, uh, what you can see is that the, the chosen mortality base table, i.e. the level part of the choice, um, has fallen significantly over that period for both males and females, but more for males. And in fact, the male life expectancy is, has um, increased by 12% um, by at age 65, uh, f merely from this changing choice of mortality table. Um, in fact, looking at the period life expectancy, males has increased from 19.3 to 21.6, and females from 22.3 to 23.5. So a smaller increase for females. And females remain longer lived than males by about uh, two years. What about improvements? Well, these are the assumed improvements that the scheme actuary, uh, which is MRSA, has baked into the um, mortality tables. And so what we're seeing in 2014, uh, which is the last valuation, is the blue line. And what I'm plotting here is across all the ages, um, the average improvement assumption over the next 50 years. And you can see for, the, um, for both males and females, it varies a bit, but it's approximately 1.5% per year uh, mortality improvement that's baked into this. Now, I said earlier, academics live longer. So if we compare this to the national population, what do we get? Well, uh, what I've shown here is the, cha the difference between the two base tables, between USS pensioners and pensioners in the, or those over 65 in the national UK population. And what we see is a uh, rather large difference, um, which is indeed increasing with age. So mortality, the mortality base table difference is greater as people get older um, across both males and females. In fact, the females shows this curious acceleration uh, with age of the difference, uh, which we have not yet been able to, to understand fully. The impact on life expectancy is, as of 2014, about three years, three years for males and about 2.3 years for females. So the magnitude by which uh, male and female academics live longer is, uh, is of that order, which is quite significant. Now, how do the current assumptions compare for improvements? Well, historical improvements, particularly uh, below age 80, have been much higher in the general population uh, relative to the assumption. And this is really comparing a 15-year look back with a 15-year <coughs> look forward on the assumption. Um, reconciling these differences is a matter of looking at detailed evolution models for cause of risk analysis, uh, uh, cause of death analysis in order to come up with that projection. And that's the way that the actuary has, uh, has developed the, the projection based on those uh, much higher mortality improvements in the past 15 years. So how does this play into the actual experience of the plan? 
Um, well, first of all, I'd like to compare what's happened in the most recent reporting year. So this is the, the reporting year which begins on the 1st of April 2014 and finishes on the 31st of March of this year. Um, and that is shown in blue. Against that, I'm comparing the national population and I'm also comparing the mortality base table assumption, wh which is in red. Um, a couple of things to note. Firstly, this is one year's data, so it's quite noisy. It's one year's data. The female data is a little bit noisier because um, females are about 40% of the plan by number and by liability size, about 30%. Um, so you can see that on both cases, there is a reasonable tracking of the assumption, although it's only a one-year sample, uh, with a, a bit more noise on the female side. But both are comfortably below uh, the mortality levels for the national population as a whole. If we look at the impact of that on, on what happens to uh, life expectancy, um, what you can see is uh, life expectancy slightly lower than the assumption, looking at just the base table assumption, uh, for both um, life expectancy at 65 and life expectancy at, at 80. Um, and indeed, the, the female life expectancy at 80 is probably skewed by that uh, rather noisy behaviour at very high ages uh, in terms of the blue line in the right-hand chart. Now, what about improvements? Well, historically, looking back over the last 15 years, um, the improvements in mortality for USS uh, pensioners, university professors, uh, has been slightly higher for males, at least at uh, ages below 80, um, and a little more variable for females. But it's been broadly in line. It hasn't been too far off. So national, uh, national population uh, improvements are probably not bad, and not too bad an estimate um, going forward, at least at the level of this very uh, high-level uh, initial an analysis. So having looked at the population of academics as a whole within the plan, uh, we then started to drill down, and this is still work in progress, at some of the subpopulations and what we're seeing here. So I mentioned earlier socioeconomic group and affluence. Um, affluence being ref reflected as a proxy in terms of the size of the pension amount. We do see variation across both these things. And so, for example, if you... If you consider every pensioner in the, in the scheme that has a low pension, so at the lowest third of pensions, and you look at them across those three socioeconomic classes that I mentioned earlier, what you see is a, a steady increase in life expectancy as you move up socioeconomic class of, of something just under three years. Now, we can do that by looking at the same thing for different affluence groups, so medium pensions and high pensions. And if we do that, you get the obvious uh, chart showing that uh, within each socioeconomic, sorry, within each um, affluence group, you have a, a steady increase by socioeconomic group. And then across each affluence group, you have increases as well such that the difference between the biggest and the smallest across both dimensions is about five years of life expectancy, which is relatively modest compared to the national population. So the, the amount of variation in life expectancy here is, is relatively small, again reflecting the more homogeneous nature uh, of the scheme. And don't forget the low and medium socioeconomic groups have a very low percentage of members associated with them. So it's mostly what's happening in the high socioeconomic group. Now against this, we can overlay the 4% of pensioners who uh, 
retired in ill health. And there you get a very interesting result. Um, as you might expect, not only is life expectancy for those who retire in ill health lower, um, but there's a greater variation in outcomes um, by virtue of the fact the, the difference between the highest and the lowest uh, life expectancy in, in ill health terms is 40% is greater at 6.9 years relative to, to five years for the pensioner population as a whole. So we'll come back to ill health in just a moment. But one of the things that people were particularly interested in were regional geographical variations. And so this is looking across all years um, and across males and females combined at the variations between different regions within the UK. We can actually do this at the level of individual universities, but that's a little political. And uh, this is perhaps the narrowest um, breakdown that we prepare, be prepared to, uh, to publish. I think, and, and again, this is based on, a, um, uh, on mortality rates using amounts, pension amounts rather than lives itself. Um, I think a, a couple of things are interesting. Firstly, there is a half year lower um, life expectancy in, in three of those key regions. Um, and astonishingly, um, for those pensioners that are outside the UK, probably retired in France somewhere, we have a much higher uh, life expectancy of a year or more. So it must be all the good wine and, and French food that's keeping them living longer. Now, just to give you an idea of what it means to switch between amounts and lives in calculating uh, mortality, um, it doesn't make too much difference to life expectancy. You can see there, uh, if, we, if we do this on a unisex basis um, and look at across all the years in the study, um, we've got a, a 0.2 year difference between amounts and lives. So uh, being weighted by pension amounts gives you a higher life expectancy because the more affluent tend to live longer. And if you compare the mortality rates underlying that, you see this big change, uh, uh, much, um, in other words, much lower mortality um, associated with the, with, the, um, uh, with the amounts waiting in the 70s and 80s, and it actually reverses uh, above age about 85 or so. Um, so what's happening there is essentially you're postponing uh, much of the mortality events until a much later time in the, in the 80s and 90s. So finally, looking at um, some of the variations across different subpopulations, um, they're generally pretty small, apart from ill health. Uh, one interesting fact is that when you look at spouses, so we, well, if we look at the pensioners who have died and their spouses now taking their pension, um, they have a statistically significant higher life expectancy, and they're, they're mostly females, uh, than females across the uh, across the the pensioner group as a whole, uh, which is which is rather rather interesting there. Um, and then, as you can see, ill health is something that shows no convergence in mortality, even at high ages. We still see a very uh, sharp distinction in mortality rates, uh, which is is virtually uh, uniform across the entire age range that we're looking at between 65 and 90. So let me just wrap up. Um, the punchline is academics do live longer um, with lower mortality rates and mortality r improvements which are slightly higher but broadly similar to the national population. The demographic profile of what we're looking at is a very homogeneous group of individuals um, with a potentially rich amount of, uh, of sort of study in, uh, of variation looking at, uh, at smaller groups uh, in greater detail. Uh, which is the subject of, of further study. Um, the variation in life expectancy within the plan as a result is, is relatively limited, uh, at least compared to, uh, to national population. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question. How uh, will uh, those 
8 billion be footed by and by whom? The deficit. The deficit will be made up by a combination of contributions that every institution pays um, as, of, uh, as of now 18% of salary into the pension scheme as a contribution and investment returns. But I have an unselfish uh, proposal. You could also take uh, some of my uh, defined benefit away because this is something that the pension regulator has done in the past and could do in the future. When there is not enough money in the uh, pocket, you will have to reduce the uh, benefits that uh, has been frivolously promised to people in good times.